Thanks for joining us today. It's good to see Ream Library full. Uh, my name is Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. Uh, welcome you to the Thomas More Lecture today. The Thomas More Lecture Series is an endowed distinguished series designed to explore ways in which the humanities illuminate moral dilemmas, enhance our capacity for understanding and empathy, and help us to imagine more just ways of being, living. You can learn more about all the McFarland Center lectures and that one online at holycross.edu. And within a couple of days, this uh, event will be also recorded and posted. I'm delighted that Princeton Classics Professor Donnell Padilla Peralta, a Roman historian, has come to speak about cultural survival and resistance in the Book of Daniel and other literatures in the second century BCE. His two colleagues, Professors Dominic Machado and uh, a classic scholar, and Mari Leonard Fleckman, a Hebrew Bible scholar, uh, took the lead in conceiving this event. Mari and Dominic are co-teaching a seminar on resistance then and now, continuing a fruitful interdisciplinary dialogue between their departments, and we're happy to see many of their students here today. I read about Donnell in a uh, long New York Times Magazine profile about a year ago, and uh, was more than intrigued, so when they suggested, I was very happy to, to oblige and welcome him. Uh, I've asked Dominic if he would do the honor of introducing Donnell. Okay, so um, it's our honor and privilege to have Donnell Padilla Peralta here um, today talking to us today. Um, he is a world-renowned classicist, humanist, and social activist, and I think um, we're all really excited to hear what he has to say. And, and so... Um, Danelle's CV is very long, so I'm going to give you a very abbreviated version of, you know, his accomplishments. So, um, Danelle is a uh, associate professor of classics at Princeton University, where he is associated with the Department of African American Studies and affiliated with programs in Latino Studies and Latin American Studies and the University Center for Human Values. Uh, a Dominican by birth and a New Yorker by upbringing. He holds degrees from Princeton, Oxford, and Stanford. And he is the author of Undocumented, which is a fantastic, fantastic memoir. Go read it if you get the chance. A Dominican Boy's Odyssey from a Homeless Shelter to, I to the Ivy League, Penguin 2015. And Divine Institutions, another fantastic, but um, more academically oriented read. Um, Religions and Community in the Middle Roman Republic, Princeton University Press 2020. And he has co-edited Rome, Empire of Plunder, The Dynamics of Cultural Appropriation with Cambridge University Press in 2017. He's got a ton of really exciting current projects ongoing, including a study of 338 BCE. The Roman Republican historian in me is very excited about this and the question of the origins of Roman imperialism, co-authored with Dennis Feeney and under contract at Harvard University Press. He's also working on a people's history of Rome, which is going to provide an exciting subaltern perspective on Roman history that is much, much needed. Um, he's got a volume on the Middle Roman Republic and new approaches towards it with uh, Seth Bernard and Lisa Mignone, which is forthcoming with Cambridge University Press. And perhaps the thing that I'm most excited about is a manifesto on race and racism in disciplinary identity of classics co-authored with Sasha May Eccleston of Brown. Um, and all this academic publishing is also paired with um, public-facing discussion of classics and justice and race in journals like Adelon and places like The Guardian, um, Matter, Vox, The New York Times, Fabulist, and Diaphanes. So please join me in welcoming Danelle Padilla Peralta. We're all excited to learn from you today. Well, thanks so much, Dominic, for the introduction, uh, and Tom um, for uh, situating uh, me and my work, um, and to all of you for um, the hospitality you've shown me since I arrived at Worcester uh, this afternoon. It is uh, a real delight to be in front of people uh, and not in front of a Zoom screen. So I, I, I can't stress um, how grateful I am to all of you, um, including Dominic and Mari, first and foremost, for making this possible. What I'm going to do is try in the next few minutes to make a case for understanding a work um, uh, whose 
um, decisive redaction occurs in the second century BCE um, as an incubator of theory, um, and, and specifically as an incubator of theories of resistance. Um, but in addition um, to doing that, I want also um, to situate the project from which um, uh, this, this paper derives um, and, and offer some comment on what I see as the rewards of thinking about texts and their associated um, cultural practices um, in this light. I owe uh, a, a particularly pronounced debt of gratitude um, mm -hmm. uh, to the Reverend Michael C. McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and to the Thomas More Lecture Series on the Humanities for this invitation. Um, I want to emphasize um, first that as an uninvited settler of color on Lenny, Lenape lands uh, in central New Jersey, um, I, I situate myself through acknowledgement of where we are, this land on which we are gathering and where many of you reside has been home to the indigenous people of the Nipmuc tribal nation. And I hope that my words today enter into productive and meaningful relationship with the historicities of that relationship. So first, as you all have heard, I'm a historian of the Roman Mediterranean, uh, at least by day. <laughs> um, I'm interested um, uh, above all else in the question of how the Roman imperial expansion uh, warps and destroys the fabric of local communities. Some communities did manage to survive uh, the imperial violences unleashed um, uh, by uh, the Roman Empire and to arrive at something akin to what indigenous theorists such as Gerald Visignor have termed survivance. Forthcoming work by the classicist Craig Williams will be vital in the continued development of linkages between indigenous studies, uh, classics, and ancient studies more generally. But other communities do not survive um, the ravages of imperial silence. And it's been part of my objective in the past few years to think around and with silences in the archival record that point to cultural ruptures and upheavals. There were options in the face of calamity, if one can even call them options, um, as Emily Mackill in a 2004 article and now the collection of essays uh, in Fashard and Harris 2021 have laid out with clarity and nuance for the ancient Greek world. But calamities did happen, uh, both in the course of imperial expansion itself, um, historical accounts of Rome's progression to Mediterranean domination are very clear about this, and in the centuries of stabilizing and exploiting the victims of that expansion that follow. In some circles, it was possible to cleave to the idea that the expansion birthed a multiculturalist empire that was marked by centuries of relative peace. As the empire sustained itself through various forms of internal violence, however, uh, this notion uh, has become somewhat harder to discredit, um, especially in the light of new evidence. With Anathea Portia Young's uh, reading of the book of Daniel and Apocalypse Against Empire uh, as one inspiration, I'm going to propose a framework for relating the significance of textualization to the formation of theories of resistance in the face of imperial and hegemonic projection. So you'll note that I've said theories and, and not practices, um, because one of my concerns is to look at texts that pattern or diagram strategies of resistance as incubators for theory, um, as engaging, in other words, in a form of abstracting thought. But to set this up, I want to emphasize that this paper is one element of a more sprawling venture into epistemicide um, in the study of the histories of the Hellenistic and Roman Mediterranean. In the words uh, of Buaventura de Souza Santos, uh, one of the post-colonial theorists uh, responsible for popularizing uh, the concept of epistemicide, quote, Colonial domination involves the deliberate destruction of other cultures. The destruction of knowledge, besides the genocide of indigenous people, is what I call epistemicide. The destruction of the knowledges and cultures of these populations, of their memories and ancestral links, and their manner of relating to others and to nature, end quote. My venture consists largely in identifying and examining the pathways for epistemicide in the Mediterranean world of the final few centuries BCE. Um, uh, in, in the 2020 paper, I argued um, that there are, in fact, several clearly uh, discernible vectors for this. There's genocidal violence and mass enslavement. There is local and regional ecological alteration. There's commercial innovation and transformation that supplants existing local commercial arrangements. There's the loss of linguistic diversity, what is nowadays characterized as linguicide. And last but not least, 
the slow but steady mushrooming of Roman and Italian religious and legal systems across the communities of the Mediterranean, likewise uh, displacing um, existing religious and legal arrangements. Each of these processes imprints itself on the configuration of collectively embodied and transmitted knowledges in these different local communal contexts, affecting how and to what extent communities facing hard decisions about resistance to Roman rule steer their way to provisional success or not. Because part of the project is concerned with the kinds of capabilities for resistance that communities could muster in the face um, of empire, I want to play two more introductory cards. My paper's title truncates uh, the title of Jose Rabasa's Tell Me the Story of How I Conquered You, Elsewhere is an Ethno-Suicide in the Colonial Mesoamerican World. Rabasa's book, A Treatment of the Epistemic Dislocations of the First Contact, attempts to recover the tactics of those communities that saw their knowledges corralled and exploited uh, by the conquistadors. Although Svetan Todorov had cleared the way for this line of inquiry in the conquest of America, uh, and, uh, the, his gaze had remained firmly on the epistemologies of the conquistadores themselves, for the most part. Rabasa is interested in how indigenous knowledge brokers plotted the subjection of their cultural systems to Spanish imperial domination. And so, as he shows, even as these knowledge brokers from indigenous communities respond to the command, quote, tell me the story of how I conquered you, unquote, these agents create and inhabit elsewhere domains of experience and trauma and celebration and collective identity that remain closed off to their European interlocutors. As the Mesoamerican scribe represents their world to the missionaries that descend on Central America in the wake of the conquest, they also project out into the space that is being defined by this new imperial dispensation, the complex interiority of indigenous experiences. But this interiority, incapable of being encompassed by or fully intelligible to subjugators, remains elusive. It remains, for the most part, illegible to the strategies that empire avails itself of in an effort to systematize its understanding of knowledge. In a minor key, the title for my remarks tonight also calls out another powerful intellectual catalyst, the novelist and interpreter Valeria Luiselli's Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions. Structured around the questions that Luiselli asked Central American child migrants as they prepare to appear before a US judge for deportation proceedings, the book documents with wrenching precision how the undocumented are compelled into habits of textualization by bureaucratic regimes. This textualization is often their only chance at survival with protection, with security. I won't graft the findings of Rabasa or of Luiselli onto the Mediterranean worlds of the second century BC. Um, my hope is simply uh, to think with them engaging how communities around the Hellenistic world respond to the epistemic ripple effects of imperial expansion by textualizing theories of resistance. That such ripple effects could travel far and wide, uh, far and, and, and wide, has been borne out quite clearly in recent scholarship. I'm thinking, for example, of Paul Cosman's uh, two books, the first on Seleucid space and the second on Seleucid time, that each demonstrate the capacity uh, of uh, Hellenizing imperial formations to nurture and propagate new orders of knowledge, new ways of arranging knowledge in a rapidly shifting world. Collision with these ways of ordering knowledge generates unrest, and in some cases, active revolt. In the third and second centuries BC, strategies for negotiating these collisions decisively converge on textualization as a technology for consolation and encouragement, and even for the coordination of collective resistance. One trenchant example um, is a book drafted and circulated by a philosopher uh, the academic uh, Cleodomachus, to his peers in captivity after the capture and destruction of Carthage. According to the Roman politician and orator Cicero, the book consisted at least in part of a lecture by his contemporary Carniades and was prepared consolam di causa, uh, for the sake of consolation. Nicholas Purcell is probably right to observe the, quote, the complicity of men uh, like uh, 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 Clitomachus with the Roman rhetorical project constitutes a more interesting and more repellent ethical problem for the historian than the swagger of Scipio, Cancerinus, or Cato, end quote. But 
the more obvious candidate um, for a Havazian reading, and not only because he seems to have been in the grip um, of Stockholm Syndrome for much of his life, is the Greek historian Polybius, um, whose histories answer the imperative, tell me how I conquered you, even as they report and communicate an embodied worldview that would have, been re that would have remained inaccessible to Polybius' most Hellenophile Roman friends. In other words, as much as Polybius documents the Roman conquest, he also documents the production of elsewheres that are not fully legible uh, to his Roman interlocutors and contemporaries. If we skip ahead for a moment to the first century BCE, one of Polybius' historiographical successors may have an even stronger claim to being recast in Hrabazian terms. This is Dionysius of Halicarnassus, characterized recently by Matthew Fox, quote, as a Greek mediating a newly confident Augustan vision of Rome to a Greek audience across the Mediterranean, end quote. He is someone who can, with good sense, be included in the roster of Greek writers responsible for the creation of what Caspar de Jong has termed a migrant literature in the early Roman Empire. Reading between the lines of Dionysius of Halicarnassus' Roman Antiquities um, brings us quite close to the affective ecology that is charted in Jose Rabassa's work in a different time and setting. Lip service to the imperative to tell the conquerors who they really were, frustration with Roman rule and its cultural and epistemic exactions, and the elsewheres that are silently enacted in the course of redescribing Romans as not being really Romans but actually Greeks. Our conquerors are actually just like us. They are us at the end of the day. For present purposes, though, I am going to focus on a somewhat different style and register of literary practice um, that arising in context of resistance to imperial subordination, uh, practices of imperial subordination that precede the final um, uh, Roman subjugation of the Eastern Mediterranean, nourishes and invigorates the fantasy of a future beyond unrest and rebellion, a future that will render unrest and rebellion irrelevant because imperial subordination will have fractured and faded away if the minders of empire are not careful. To this end, I will focus on a text from the margins that's forged in the crucible of Judean talkbacks to Hellenistic and Roman imperial expansion, and that is the Book of Daniel. With Daniel, I wish to explore modes of knowledge that emerge around unrest um, and their materialization in myth historical scripts that model and theorize proper behavior in the face of imperial domination. These scripts, in addition to outlining the kind of behavior that can enable the subjugated and subaltern to remain true to their culturally specific knowledges under arbitrary and capricious rulers, also sow the seeds for more disquiet and unrest down the road not only by holding out hope for a future after domination, but by drilling the lesson that the realization of that future will require the destruction of alternative knowledges. In taking up Daniel, I am also answering the summons of George Hufke and others to bridge some of the disciplinary gaps that separate biblical studies from classics, qua classics, or ancient Mediterranean studies written at a remove from biblical studies. One final preliminary. I should be clear that in prioritizing, in prioritizing the theory work um, involved in the production and circulation of texts, I don't mean to assign it normative value as the best mode for formulating or negotiating tactics of resistance to hegemonic intrusion. But I think it has to be stated that there is a default presumption wired in many of us who study ancient Mediterranean cultures that texts are endowed with a certain kind of normative value, and we should push back against this. I am simply tracking what the turn to textualization may have afforded communities as they maneuvered around the depredations of empire in the anarchic Hellenistic Mediterranean, so vigilantly conjured up by author Eckstein and others. What non-textualizing local and indigenous practices for scripting and preserving the memories of resistance and accommodation look like is a bit harder to say. We don't have something uh, like Lee Maracle's oratories for the ancient Mediterranean, though, as Catherine Blouin and colleagues have reminded us, it is still possible, in spite of the silence, to bring the conceptual affordances of indigenization to bear robustly on the ancient world. But I'll defer that discussion to the Q&A if folks want uh, to explore that point more. The Book of Daniel was composed in stages, with the stories in its early chapters likely coming together or in circulation already in the fourth and third centuries, and the major apocalypses unambiguously pointed in the direction of Hellenistic and uh, Roman intrusions into Hellenistic Roman power politics, usually sourced to the second century. 
Several versions of Daniel were floating around during or shortly after the rule of the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes, uh, who was in harness from 175 to 164 BCE. Antiochus' measures against Jewish ritual observance, or perhaps elite Jewish ritual observance, ultimately trigger the revolts narrated and glorified in Maccabees. Two features of Daniel's structure should be flagged. First is its linguistic patterning, which has elicited a fair amount of comment. Chapters 1, 1 to 2, uh, 4a and chapters 8 to 12 were originally composed in late biblical Hebrew, while chapter two, chapters 2, 4 to the end of chapter 7 uh, in Aramaic. While Porter Young sees this alternation in languages as an attempt, quote, to underscore the change in situation and call an end to cooperation and accommodation, end quote, I think the better line on this arrangement is Paul Cosman's quote. The sequence of languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew, traces the shift from co covenantal independence to imperial world empire and then to the eschatological reclaiming of that national autonomy, end quote. The second notable feature of Daniel's structure is that the stories of chapters one through six seem to be, have been in motion separately from those of chapters seven through 12. Their eventual braiding together may have been initiated in a diaspora context, but was probably brought to its decisive textual realization uh, in Jerusalem. This locking together of different tales results not only in the text, but a theory of resistance that exceeds the sum of its parts, and I'll have more to say on this point um, in a moment. Daniel is a real treasure trove. Um, its medley of genres and characters and the deep cultural background of its interlinked stories proving enormously inviting um, for researchers from the very dawn of biblical criticism. The stories have a lengthy reception history that begins in antiquity as the ongoing study and publication of the Hukok mosaics has made abundantly clear. And Daniel as a textual unity continues to excite and confound in equal measure. The book's obvious familiarity with and direct attention to the jostling for status and power uh, in the Hellenistic Mediterranean has placed it at the center of contemporary scholarly debates about the extent of Judean Hellenization. These debates in turn orbit around the question given memorably sharp expression by Seth Schwartz some years ago, were Jews a Mediterranean society? To the list of markers of Jewish Mediterraneanness or Mediterraneanization that's supplied by Stephen Weitzman in his review of Seth Schwartz's book, we should add the fusion of exemplary pastness and apocalyptic futurity as a technology for theorizing the violence of imperial subjection and at the same time building up a collective capacity to resist it. This technology has a long pedigree um, that I won't elaborate here, but one aspect of it worth emphasizing is the general move in third and second century Judaism away from prophetic and towards apocalyptic literatures, which is rather more plugged into mainstream Hellenism than some scholars have been willing to concede. In any case, my narrow focus for the next few minutes is going to be on Daniel's coupling of theory with textualization. At the core of Daniel's storytelling, I will contend, are four interrelated theories about the right forms of accommodation and resistance to imperial domination, and I will now set them out. One, the subjugated can preserve their culturally specific knowledges, accumulate new knowledge, and wield a hybridized result at a moment's notice in the service of empire under the right conditions. This is a theory about the cognitive adaptability and plasticity of the subjugated, or of a certain subgroup within the subjugated. We can say more about this during the Q&A, too. In the opening chapter of Daniel, Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility are brought to the palace of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, quote, to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Those who are funneled to the court include Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who are renamed Belteshazzar, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a renaming that isomorphic with other onomastically mediated processes of social death and rebirth in the slaving worlds of the Hellenistic Mediterranean actually carries over the theophoric properties of their former names across cultural and religious gradients. Crucially, these, choose, these four choose not to abide by the palace protocol for food and decline the royal rations so as not to defile their bodies. Their reward from their god is to have their knowledge even further enhanced such that when the king orders them to be brought out, quote, in every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom, end quote. This is chapter 17 to 21 of book one, oh, of, of uh, section 17 to 21 of chapter one. This aptitude will be put to work in interpreting dreams, one of the more famous of which I will scrutinize in a moment. 
For now, there are two historical peculiarities of this section of Daniel that I'd like to devote some further comment to. First is the business of hostage taking as talent requisition, which is attested in numerous other settings for the second century. And one more reason why we can confidently assume that the final redaction of Daniel takes place during this period. The thronging of Near Eastern royal courts with specialized religious scholars is confirmed for earlier periods too, but the scene setting in Daniel is cut from a more Hellenistic cloth. After all, the machinery of mass enslavement in the Hellenistic Mediterranean creates incentives for captive representatives of subordinated communities not only to show off their abilities, but to make the case that these abilities rested on cultural commitments that were worth safeguarding. This brings me to the second point, which is that some knowledge brokers enjoyed great success in making a case for their epistemic and world-ordering practices. Michael Siegel is surely right to note that chapter one, quote, emphasizes the potential for Jews to succeed as Jews in the diaspora by excelling in their training in the foreign king's court while all the while maintaining the strict restrictions which preserve their unique identity in this context, end quote. But other knowledge brokers and the communities from which they hail do not enjoy this same success, and their failure is actually a necessary part of imagined excellence at accommodating empire. Maya Katrosis is undoubtedly right to observe that Daniel offers, quote, an improbable and idealized picture of diasporic negotiation in which the diasporic subject manages to ascend to the heart of colonial administrations while they themselves stay steadfast and culturally intact, even as kings lose their minds, end quote. I'm going to come back to this point shortly. The second theory is a commitment of fidelity. We will die for the law, or rather it is appropriate to perform a willingness to die for the law. By the time that Josephus, uh, in the first century CE, sits down to compose his Jewish antiquities, this was a well-established trope, but I'm interested in examining it not just as a trope, but as a theory. In an analysis of the most famous set scenes of dying for the law in Josephus, Stephen Weitzman has observed, quote, although these performances simulated the spectacles of death that so entranced the Romans, they, they used the, the histrionics of dying to make possible a different kind of denouement, one of, in which the performers are spared from actually having to die, end quote. Mutatis mutandis, one can see a roughly similar logic at work in the book of Daniel which adduces the death the yielding apparatuses of Hellenistic courts to frame instances of Jews who manifest an undealing, unyielding determination to observe the law, even at the cost of their lives, except that they then actually survive. As Tessa Rajak has detailed with reference to Maccabees, martyrdom is a Hellenizing discourse, and so too is the script of facing martyrdom and emerging triumphant. Daniel is staked to that fantasy the fantasy that, when faced by the seemingly black and white choice between capitulating to the demands of empire or dying in resistance, the subjugated may be able to pull both off. Martyrdom, as well as ethno-suicide, to revisit another term of art in the Jose Havasa universe, is proffered, but the proffer is remembered because these do not actually take place. The most transparent instance of this occurs in Daniel 3, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are menaced by King Nebuchadnezzar with being, quote, thrown into a furnace of blazing fire if they do not worship the 60-cubit tall golden statue that the king has had erected on the plain of Dura. There will be no deliverance from certain death. Quote, who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? End quote, 315. The three stick to their refusal to worship the statue, are promptly tossed into the furnace, and a short time later are spotted walking around in the flames apparently untouched. Nebuchadnezzar orders them free, marvels that they, quote, yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god, end quote, and issues a proclamation that anyone who blasphemes their god, quote, shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way, end quote. Not only are they vindicated in their decision to die for the law, they live to be promoted, but the prohibition on any blasphemy that is directed at their god is arguably even more revealing than their survival. The text imagines that, as a consequence of their resistance, the rug will be pulled out from, other, out from under other communities and individuals whose worship of another divinity on a par with the Jewish god could be construed as blasphemous, 
In other words, that the power of empire will be wielded not just to protect the communal ways of knowing to which Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego subscribe, but to inflict harm on the agents of other systems of religious knowledge. In this light, the trope of dying for the law externalizes the desire to see alternative knowledges perish so that one's culturally specific one might live. The wish for the epistemicide of others is encoded into its DNA. It's significant that the royal decree in Daniel 3 is held up as a technology of epistemicide because portions of Daniel were almost certainly being fine-tuned as Antiochus IV hands down some of his more notorious decrees, and as a consequence, the writers of Daniel are all too sensitive to the force of the royal decree as a vehicle for the consolidation and affirmation of some cultural practices and the exclusion, marginalization, and effacement of others. Three, we see into you, we can know you, our rivals can't. We see the future, our rivals can't. A linchpin of Daniel's content and messaging, this theme has been carefully picked over by readers of Daniel. Tell your servants the dream and we will reveal the interpretation, the Chaldeans of the court promised Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 after he reports being troubled in his sleep. Except Nebuchadnezzar plays coy. He wants the wise men to tell him his dream and its interpretation. And when the Chaldeans plead with him to divulge the dream first, Nebuchadnezzar accuses them of stalling for time and has them rounded up for execution. At this stage, Daniel rises to the challenge. Having first asked his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, quote, to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions with the rest of the wise men of Babylon might not perish, end quote, the eponymous hero has the mystery of the dream and its interpretation disclosed to him in a vision of the night, 217, 219. This dream is famously of a statue, luminous, colossal, terrifying. It's said it's made of gold, upper torso and arms out of silver, lower torso and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and its feet of iron and clay. As the dream progresses, a stone appears and smashes the feet of clay and iron, and then as the remainder of the statue collapses, its pieces are swept away. But the stone morphs into a mountain spanning the earth. Daniel's interpretation memorably casts the dream as an evocation of the transfer of empire. After Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, gold, another will rise, silver, and then another bronze, to be followed by yet another strong as iron that shall, quote, crush and shatter all of these. But as a mixed kingdom, it will be fated not to remain together, quote, just as iron does not mix with clay, end quote. It will be brought to heel by the one lasting kingdom installed by the God of heaven and therefore indestructible. Impressed with Daniel's knowledge of the dream and its significance, Nebuchadnezzar prostrates himself before him, showers him with gifts, and grants him and his close friends promotions. Another successful if perplexing entry in the annals of minority engagement with imperial domination. Components of this story find parallels and analogs in other sectors and times of the ancient Near East and the classical and Hellenistic Mediterranean, so testing oracles and dream interpreters, there's Croesus's test of the oracle in the Greek historian Herodotus, there's Sarquinius of Purpose's challenge to the augur Addis Navius in the Roman analytic tradition, and the four kingdom paradigm is not unique to Daniel. There are variations on this theme in the fourth civil line oracle, the Babylonian dynastic prophecy, Aemilius Sura, and Pseudo-Daniel. For our purposes though, what's most important is that dream interpretation is flagged as a site for the subjugated to reclaim agency over the hegemon, not only by demonstrating their capacity to know the mind of the conqueror, but by laying before him the impermanence of his hegemony. In the case of Daniel's narrative, this feat success is made conditional once again on besting other rival practitioners of knowledge, and it translates directly into material rewards. Other dreams are felicitously interpreted in Daniel. Uh, and Felicity attends the interpreter even when the message of the dream is bleak for the king himself. Without, have, without the time today to cycle through each one, I, I want simply to advance one claim on the basis of Daniel 3, which is that the inward turn of dream interpretation fastens onto the response of the subjugated and subaltern to one material imposition uh, of imperial exploitation, namely deracination. It theorizes dream interpretation as one skill that can travel even when its holder is displaced from home and hearth. I've already commented with reference to point one that Daniel and his friends were removed from, and sent, uh, removed from uh, their home communities and sent to the king's court. 
This forced displacement leaves them with nothing except the resources of their embodied knowledge, which they have to wield somehow. In the universe constructed by the text, dream interpreters from those communities at the end of the imperial spear may not be masters of their time and space, but they are masters of elsewheres, precincts removed from the immediate course of control of the hegemon that are accessible only with the keys of dream interpretation. The dream and its interpretation set Daniel apart from other wannabe interpreters in an exemplification of what Lawrence Wills in The Jew in the Court of the Foreign King has characterized as the ruled ethnic perspective. Paul Cosman has followed this line while also adding a supplement to this interpretation, thinking in very concrete terms about the figuration of the statue as a body and the body as a statue that is so central um, to uh, the four kingdom prophecy slash dream be constructed in Daniel. Cosman writes, quote, the statue's destruction has long been situated within a distinctly Jewish prophetic discourse and anti-idol polemic. But the central image, which is without close parallel in the Hebrew Bible, should rather be understood within the developed Hellenistic political culture of statues, their unmaking, and the self-periodizing of communal histories, end quote. Within the broad civic culture of the Hellenistic world, Paul Cosman continues a few pages later, destroying the king's statue was a widespread public and self-conscious idiom for periodizing a community's history. End quote. Also interactive with this idea, though, is the visualization of historical time, the progression of historical time as bodily, a thought structure that's key not only to Daniel, but also to a contemporaneous text, the histories of Polybius that I referenced earlier. Polybius himself discusses how in the aggregation of all of the different local community histories of the Yoikumene um, into an organic whole, the Greek word he uses for this is somatoides, uh, we see um, the realization of a kind of universalizing paradigm for history, one that is very much bound up uh, with the body as a site of interpretation and evaluation. In any case, the more important point is that from mastery over the visions of others, it's only a short step to mastery as enacted through one's own vision. And this is something that chapters 10 to 12 of Daniel communicate in stirring terms. Daniel is granted a vision that sweeps from the Achaemenid world of Cyrus the Great to the Hellenistic world in the maws of Rome, to the time of anguish, and finally to deliverance. I pass over the text presentation of Daniel as equally adept at navigating the universe of the Neo-Babylonians and the new dispensation of the Achaemenids, which is a feature of the compositional history and evolution of Daniel. But in that time, the time of anguish, uh, the angel Gabriel proclaims near the end of Daniel, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The clause, everyone who is found written in the book, brings me to the fourth and final component um, of this model um, uh, that I've laid out on this slide, which I'll elucidate briefly. We will come and dear the technologies of empire. They will be our salvation. There's one technology in particular um, uh, that comes to the fore as exceptionally right for weaponization, and this is the technology of the book. The textualization of Jewish communities throughout the Mediterranean has often been assumed to originate in a commitment to the preservation and exegesis um, of the Torah. But this commitment is scaled up in a dramatic way after the fall of the Second Temple, with the Mishnah in particular attesting to the multi-generational investment in the production of exegetical texts as a means of amassing and safeguarding a new species of cultural capital in the wake of collective devastation. Duncan McRae, among others, has dexterously brought this cultural development into conversation with the textualization of Roman cultural practices in the late Republic, a historical conjuncture where one can see how writing and systematization work together to very transformative effects. But Daniel 12's mention of enrollment in the book points to something quite different, um, and actually something that deserves to be interpreted on a rather separate axis of cultural practices. Commentators have been quick to point to obvious intertextual parallels, so the Book of Life and Psalms, a concept that's appropriated with Gusto in the New Testament and in the Apocrypha. But the depictions of enrollment in the book bring another set of possibilities to mind, a set of possibilities that I've teed up by using the noun enrollment. 
This clause activates the metaphor of being put down for a census or being put down for military service, two of the signature coercive devices of the Hellenistic state and, in time, the Roman state. But there's another way of taking this reference um, uh, to uh, the book, um, and it's one that is more in the spirit um, of Duncan McRae's arguments about textualization. The heavy lifting of Daniel's closing vision lies as much in its exaltation of the book uh, as the guardian and vindicator of the subjective as it does in its millenarian tincture. In a Mediterranean where books and bodies were frequently lost on land and at sea, the conviction in the durability of that one book whose previous function as a technology of state power would be radically redefined is arguably the most utopian feature of Daniel. Is it sensible then to join some scholars in speaking of Daniel as a utopian text? Writing in a somewhat different vein and with, different, with reference to a different uh, archive, but with her eye still on the second century, um, Paige Dubois has enjoined ancient historians to attend more carefully to the fear that streaks through the Mediterranean world of mass enslavement, that the boundary line between free and slave could be destabilized and scrubbed clean, not just incidentally or temporarily, um, as dramatized on the, on the stages of new comedy, but permanently. On my reading, the processes of textualization and its kin, scripturalization, that give birth to Daniel are not only bulwarks against cultural loss and epistemicide, they're an education in how to menace the conqueror by reminding him both that his domination will come to an end and that for its duration he will have to depend on the skills of those he has subjugated. It is the subjugated who will tell him how it all ends, using the technologies that the conqueror depends on in order to survive, chief among them, the enrollment procedures enshrined and made good through books. These then are four pillars of resistance theory that are erected in Daniel. I haven't paid attention to the whole range of strategies for resistance that the book surveys. Here is Portier Young tidily bringing together the various strands, including uh, features of Daniel that I have not commented on in my remarks. The writers of Daniel outlined for their audiences a program of nonviolent resistance to the edict and persecution of Antiochus and the systems of hegemony and domination that supported his rule. New Revelation provided an apocalyptic frame for covenant theology and offered hermeneutical keys for interpreting scripture in ways that anchored the writer's self-understanding and understanding of history, current events, and God's future action. Each of these in turn shaped the vision for resistance that included prayer, fasting, and penitence, teaching and preaching, and covenant fidelity even in the face of death. They presented their program for action through prediction and narrative modeling." End quote. Poirier Young's narrative modeling comes close to my own understanding of theory as a kind of exemplification, as a patterning not merely of a historically contingent response to suffering, but of a framework for abstraction. Work on exemplarity in Roman culture has enriched my own grasp of the cognitive affordances of the exemplar, and in particular, its ability to organize and direct models for right doing and right thinking. But I find equally energizing the prospect of reading these pillars of resistance theory as propositional in the sense newly put forward by Kenesha Sherald Parsar. Daniel seems to me as good a testing ground for the multidimensional temporalities that are unlocked when we vision historical documents as sites of proposition. Each of these, then, is a theory that can be tested, and its efficacy is continuously reassessed in light of evidence not just contemporaneous with uh, the circulation of the redacted form of Daniel, but in the aftermath and afterlife of Daniel's reception. But the closing question that I want to leave us all with um, is what happens when there is no textualization of theories of resistance and survival? Or to put it another way, what happens to communities that run out of time to textualize in the teeth of hegemonic brutality? For this, we'll have to go to the other side of the Mediterranean. Eric Gruen has shown that diaspora humor um, did some serious lifting in the generation of communal strategies for resilience. Um, but humor alone was insufficient armor, though, as Amy Richland's study of slavery and Roman comedy has shown, it can be quite a potent armor. In order to examine what happens when there is no opportunity for communities 
to textualize theory with the possibility of that textualization then being transmitted to subsequent centuries. It would be important to look at cases from the Western Mediterranean where, in fact, we can see the onrush of he hegemonic pr progression and projection limiting the capacity of communities to muster defenses of their practices and of their ways of being in the world that receive a visible footprint in the literary tradition. Here I'll close with one incident from the second century Western Mediterranean that shines a slanting light on the downsides of not plugging into textualization and that I had discussed briefly in the 2020 article on ep epistemicide that I referenced early on in the talk. This incident is the slaughter uh, of a community of Lusitanians uh, by the Roman praetor Servius Sulpicius Galba. This is a, an exceptionally notorious event um, in uh, Roman uh, 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 incursions in and the conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. And it's relayed to us uh, in the, the historians Appian and in several other sources um, from the second century CE, but we have evidence already contemporaneous um, with Galba, um, mainly in the form of a series of fragments from the writings of Cato the Elder that attested the significance um, of this incident. While he was serving a term in Iberian Lusitania, Galba directed the massacre of several tribes that had placed themselves under his protection. On his return to Rome, when he was prosecuted on a capital charge for unauthorized killing and enslaving, he alleged, and this is where our sources become a bit muddled, that the Lusit either that the Lusitanians had been planning to attack him, or that they had been sacrificing human beings, or that they had performed the ritual act of human sacrifice as a prequel to attacking him. This model of testimonies could be reconciled if we suppose that this was a fog of imperial war scenario in which Galba misconstrues a ritual act by one of the tribes as a sign of imminent attack. There are numerous parallels from borderlands conflicts um, uh, that we could appeal to. We might speculate as to what the Roman overreaction signaled um, to those communities that witnessed the slaughter uh, and those communities that survived it. Besides the rawness of the traumatic memory of Roman violence, another lesson would have warmed its way into their minds, that their religious rituals and ways of life were henceforth to be policed, with some being deemed worthy of extirpation. But our speculation here runs up against a wall of silence because these communities did not textualize in ways that become legible um, for us to later engage. There is the so-called, and I, I want to stress um, uh, that this is a, a term um, being used by ancient and modern historians with which I take some exception. There is the so-called squanto effect of native informants generating and circulating their own perspectives to Roman authorities, an argument that has been put forward by Greg Wolf and others with particular emphasis on the dynamics of cultural interchange in the Western Mediterranean. But these reports are not packaged in ways that mirror, um, let alone prove conducive to, the full throttle textualization of Iberian resistance and of Iberian theories for the preservation and promotion of tactics of resistance in the long run. As a consequence of this absence, what we're left with in the case of the Iberian Peninsula is the sound of Romans and Greeks shouting at each other about rebellion and unrest in Iberia, first in the heat of the incident's prosecutorial aftermath, and then later through the mediation of texts written in Latin and Greek, but at no point checked until much, much later by devices for refracting subjection and death through the prism of a resistance theory. The situation in the Eastern Mediterranean differs markedly from the scenario that I've sketched for the Western Mediterranean. But the proximate and ultimate causes of that difference are a story for another day. I want to conclude by emphasizing what is advantageous about thinking through these four items as instances of theory about resistance and recovery in their own right. I would argue first that with each of these items, we see not just a statement of and a description of um, a strategy, but a proposition in need of testing and retesting by readers and interlocutors with the Book of Daniel. In other words, it is important to attend to the reception history of the Book of Daniel in order to make sense of the viability and meaningfulness of these different components of resistance theory, because it is in that reception history that we find efforts to test out different aspects of these four pillars. But the other aspect, um, uh, the other 
facet of this that I want um, to stress by way of conclusion is that you might find it important to push back against the idea that these are theories. And if that is the case, we will need to do some thinking about what kinds of terms are available for us for characterizing efforts at abstracting beyond the contingencies of any one moment or any one sequence of moments in the complex interplay of the subjugated and the subjugator. So in other words, if this isn't theory, or if it's not describable as theory, the question that remains unanswered um, and in need of some kind um, uh, uh, of robust addressing is how best to describe this. When I turned um, earlier um, to Portier Young's summary um, of the different kinds uh, of um, strategies of resistance that are apparent in the Book of Daniel, I pay particular attention to her phrase narrative modeling um, with its emphasis um, on um, the, the form of Daniel itself um, as key to an attempt uh, to develop a textualizing and specifically narrativizing um, uh, a form um, of resistance. But I wonder if in the end of the day, tying ourselves to the commitment to narrative um, uh, as a staging ground for the elucidation of forms of theory is in and of itself sufficient um, to characterize both the complex interplays that we've been diagramming in this paper and other strategies for resistance that might escape the fold of the literary. So at the end of the day, when we come to thinking more about the possibilities of Daniel as an incubator of theory, I would want us also to think about the extent to which literary and narrativizing forms of resistance are insufficient to capturing the full bandwidth and scope of the various forms um, of objection, um, of writing back to, of speaking and shouting back to that might be emblematic of the most successful attempts at undermining the potencies of empire. Well, that's it for now. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to questions. Thanks for your talk. This was wonderful. Um, I have a question that goes to theory number four and about textualization um, as a tool. So isn't textualization itself a hegemonic import? as you've described. And if that's the case, I mean, as you suggested at the end of your talk, is it likely to succeed? Can one actually use it and, and turn that tool, turn that weapon back? Um, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, can master's tools uh, um, disassemble a, a master's house? Um, and, and how do you see that within the larger strategy in Daniel, like is this kind of like a hopeful, optimistic moment and we should just kind of expect it not to go anywhere or do we see places where that really succeeds? Thanks so much for being the first to ask a question and for this excellent question. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what to make of the, of the vibe um, about um, this, um, this tools in, um, in Daniel. Um, and I could see, two different arguments being made. Um, there's also a third that comes to mind that I did not flag explicitly in the talk, but that I'll try to um, uh, keep uh, my focus on when I, after I try to offer up um, a, a more direct response to, to your question. The first argument um, is, for all intents and purposes, a pretty optimistic one, right? So we're gonna take this tool, and it's gonna be fine. We, we know how to moderate our use of this tool so that it is most advantageous to us, right? There might be some people who are, are harmed unintentionally by this. Um, and this goes to the point um, that I was trying to lay out in the paper about the prospects that other communities who are not quite as well positioned or first movers in the use of this tool um, suffer disadvantage and harm in the end. But, we got this tool, we're gonna to use it, we're gonna be very effective at it, boom, that's it. The second um, answer is a, a somewhat more guarded take up, right? Um, and and if, if one were looking at uh, the sort of record um, from uh, Judea Palestine of cultural practices and looking also at the archeological record um, for this period, one could make a more generalizing case, case about a more guarded take up, right? 
The idea of this guarded take up is that we will use this tool selectively, very selectively, um, as and when we think it necessary, but we must al always be mindful of the possibility that this tool might co-opt us in various ways. And so we must, where and as possible, corral or restrain the use of this tool. Um, so another way of coding this would be to say that the um, investment in textualization as a form of Hellenicity um, is partial um, at best. This, of course, occludes a, a, like a, a related question, and this is a quibble that I, I, I would hope some folks would want to blow up into more than a quibble uh, with me, which is whether we are to understand the kinds of textualization that I've been diagramming in this paper as, like a, as properly speaking, Hellenizing, or whether we should like adopt another vocabulary. Um, the other possibility here, um, and this now gets to the not as direct, but arguably um, as consequential um, uh, answer to your question as, as the first two that I floated, is that we focus more on um, forms of embodied understanding and we try to think about what this means. Um, so to play with um, uh, your uh, allusion uh, to the Audre Lorde line for a moment, um, what, if, what if the master's tool is a human being, is, a, is, a, is, is, is the capabilities, the competencies, the knowledges um, of a human being? This is what I think is so um, remarkable about the dream interpretation sequences in Daniel. Um, it's also what I think is so remarkable about like a sort of broader second century BC uptake in sort of forms of dream interpretation throughout the Mediterranean. I mean, this is like not restricted to Daniel. Like we see a lot of evidence for this in other parts of the Mediterranean. Um, and even though it's difficult to find sort of concrete evidence for the standardization of dream interpretation, so sometime later, this comes in the first century CE and second century CE, nonetheless, there is this very vibrant interest in understanding dream interpretation um, as something that can inhere in, in the persons and in the hexes of persons um, who are in sort of circulation at this period, right? Is this separable from textualization? I don't know. Um, but. It, it would, I think, be a precondition of any sort of meaningful answer to, to your question that I attempt to sort of tease apart the two, right? Because if I want to think with Lord and envision some of the folks who are um, in circulation, um, either um, in diasporic circulation um, as migrants um, or in diasporic circulation as folks who have been enslaved and are being trafficked, um, one of the more valuable features of the line of argument that the paper has tried to uh, put forward is an understanding of their embodied knowledges as constituting them um, from the vantage point of their enslavers as tools, but from their own internal perspective um, as, 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 as people who can weaponize their own knowledges against or possibly with the sort of connivance of other members of their community. Um, as a counter to uh, the projects of enslavement and subjection to which they've been subjected. But I mean, I, I think here we would have to be more sort of expansive in, in documenting um, the, the forms of asymmetric dependence that characterize this period and their epistemic implications. Um, and there I, I, I would need to do more thinking too about how to ca ca characterize the different sort of layers and levels of authority that are being represented um, in Daniel. So those are, that's two and a half answers to your question. Um, more questions. I mean, as folks think. I mean, one, one issue to, to, that I would love to hear folks thinking on is whether any of these four premises um, is testable by reference um, to other histories of subjugation and domination that are accessible to you, about which you are conversant or fluent, right? So this is, if this is to have purchased as theory, one, I, I wouldn't say it's a necessity, but one of its properties should be that it is generalizable. And so I would invite folks to think about whether any of this is generalizable. 
So thinking about it as generalizable, I was thinking about the Sicilian slave revolts and mm -hmm. the use of prophecy there. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking, too, in the American context, things like um, Nat Turner, where prophecy and this claim to knowledge fits into um, the ability to resist, right? The ability to lay claim to some alternate power. One thing that I, I find interesting in comparing those two is that um, there's violence in, these, in all of those prophecies, but the violence doesn't manifest itself in Daniel the way that it might in, say, the case of Eunice or the case of Nat Turner. Um, but, you know, in, to some extent against, you know, Antiochus, we do get that violence. So how do you see violence playing into this theory of resistance when we see um, dream interpretations connected to violence in sort of ancient historical and modern historical parallels about resisting against a subjugator? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for that question, Dominic. Um, and I think you're absolutely right to, to flag the Sicilian slave rebellions and also the, the histories of slave rebellions more generally um, uh, as crucial sites for the interplay of prophecy um, and, and coordinated violence. Um, here's where I think, um, so Fourier Young's book is excellent, but it is, in my view, incorrect on one fundamental thing, which is that I do not see Daniel as committed solely to a program of nonviolent resistance. Um, so among other things, the, the vision um, uh, of the transfer of empire um, and its progression is, I think, marked with violence. Um, but to widen the lens, I see in this, both in the sort of second century context of uh, the Sicilian slave rebellions and also in other instances of prophecy being leveraged um, uh, in connection uh, with rebellion. Um, a pretty powerful illustration um, of points three and four. The reason I would like to see it as illustrative of four is because there are efforts afoot in the context of the slave rebellions both from antiquity and early modernity and modernity to control the forms um, of religious slash theological visioning that the subjugated can undertake. And to that end, the work of prophecy, precisely to undermine that, um, uh, takes on uh, an exceptional charge, right? But I think also the, the one feature of this that might be sort of worthwhile elucidating um, is one that I floated briefly in, in response to, to Catherine's question. Um, often nowadays I think back to work done on Afro-diasporic religions, um, especially the, the anthropological work in the 80s, 90s, and early aughts uh, by Karen McCarthy Brown and others. And, McCarthy Brown has this amazing passage um, uh, from uh, her ethnographic study of voodoo um, in which thinking back to the histories of Afro-religious, uh, Afro-diasporic religious practice, um, she imagines that in the absence of all of the technologies of the sacred um, uh, that could not be brought over um, of the transatlantic passage, folks became ever so imaginative and inventive with the capabilities of prophecy because their minds were what they had, right? Now, I don't think, I, people have criticized McCarthy Brown for this and with reason. Like, I, this is not like strictly speaking true. Um, people were able to bring, um, in some cases, like at the actual materialities of their religious ritual with them. Um, and this is also true um, to the extent that we can document it uh, in ancient Mediterranean context for reasons brought out by Simon Price and others, folks are traveling with the gods and company. After all, one of these foundation myths um, uh, that 
Romanists tend to spend a fair bit of time scrutinizing is a foundation myth that involves not just an immigrant traveling from one corner of the Mediterranean to another, but crucially an immigrant who is traveling with the Penates, however you understand this, whatever you understand them to be. Um, and so held out for our consideration is the idea that not just the sort of abstraction of, of deity or divinity, but the reality of divinity and deity and cult can move too and do move, even in context of subjugation. Even so, I find it attractive to think with McCarthy Brown about what happens when, in context of mass enslavement, folks are left with the resources of their embodied knowledges. Um, and I think the answer to that question is that there is a, 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 a more pronounced emphasis on the development um, uh, and, and carriage um, uh, of a distinctive form um, of ritual praxis, divination and prophecy um, that shines through in these settings, right? But it, this is where, I mean, it's, it's like, this is where it, one might also want to like resist the temptation to generalize. I mean, this is like where generalization becomes creaky. So, you know, I, here too, I, I, I would hedge by saying that for all that, I would like to see points three and four uh, as, as, as crystallizing in, 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 the, in the cases that you've named, I would also be more than willing um, uh, to um, scale back my ambitions for that reading. Yeah. Um, one of your theories is the impermanence, recognizing the impermanence of uh, hegemony. Um, just to play devil's advocate here and look at the flip side of the coin, couldn't then one argue that there's also the impermanence of culture mm -hmm. um, and the need to not necessarily um, resist or um, look back at the, these fight for uh, cultures as reasonable or tangible? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, thanks for that. That that's a that's a great point. I mean, so in a moment, in a moment of crankiness, when I was working up the, like the epistemicide paper, um, and re responded to a question at a presentation of a draft of the project that had invited me to think about communities that make claim to cultural continuity across like very lengthy durees of time. I said, well, actually, these are like fictions, right? So like, I, th th these are all, you know, like I, whatever sort of rubric of fictionality you want to use, you can sort of talk in Andersonian terms about it, imagined communities, like wh however you go, like the, the idea that these continuities are, 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 are rooted in, in, in some sort of hardcore of fact seem to me to strain the imagination. Actually, what I saw these communities fighting um, was like the, the profoundly destabilizing um, prospect that at the end of the day, they had been stitched together around um, a fiction of continuity. Um, and that part of the process of cultural regeneration was to invest ever more resources uh, in, in maintaining this fiction, right? Now, this is not, um, this idea is not without, its, it, it, without some like warts. Um, so, for one, it, it, it does write on like a, a kind of sort of bravura slash like super um, confident um, uh, um, approach um, that would arrogate to me or to the historian um, abstracted from me uh, the right to determine which communities have managed faithfully to commit themselves to the project of cultural preservation, which communities have not, which communities have been effective at, um, at cultivating and maintaining um, forms that ensure uh, the transmission of knowledge over time, and which communities are actually engaging in a form of, like, myth, right? But, I mean, if, if, if one approaches it from the position that actually point number one is at its core about the efficacy of a myth, right, that, that, that this is like basically mythological in nature, this idea that the subjugated can preserve knowledge, can amass new knowledge, and harness both while also holding true to their culture, then maybe it's, while a pretty sort of bold claim, not one that would on its face be sort of e immediately um, debunkable. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the other, the other difficulty I have here as I think about your question is that 
with any of the sort of cultural formations that we're discussing, there are some clear or seemingly clear efforts at maintaining and disseminating forms of cultural practice across time and space, even though these forms have like wildly divergent meanings, um, depending on how and where they circulate. Um, but that commitment to form may in itself hold another key to answering your question. So we might assume, so here's 1A um, as a variation on 1, that the new knowledges that are being generated are knowledges um, uh, that step into the breach opened up by the loss of cultural knowledge. But this loss of cultural knowledge cannot actually be named as such. Right? Like you, you cannot actually characterize this as a loss. One might also say that actually what one does, or what one is sort of tending towards, is the vision that there are, and, and this is like a really like sort of borderline chauvinistic vision um, that would have appealed immensely to some communities in the Mediterranean. And I'm thinking in particular of like a certain sort of idiolect of Roman ideology about this. There are some communities that can just accumulate all of this information about other communities and never like lose their inner beating core, right? So we see Romans in particular already from the third century BC making a series of like somewhat outlandish claims about their own cultural plasticity, right? Like we take things from like all these different Italian communities, but like we don't change. By the late Republic, this will be different though, because there's gonna be a morning of change that's gonna set in and people are gonna start expressing worries that in fact the old Roman ways have gone by the wayside and they've been replaced by these new ways. But for the middle Republican scene and down into the late second century BC, there's still this commitment to this idea that this one particular community has somehow been singularly, exceptionally gifted at curating these different forms of knowledges from how to build aqueducts to like how to use different kinds of knives. Um, this is a appeal to Dominic that I say this. Um, without surrendering everything that it had brought with it up to that point. This is of course like sort of impossible, but like I, I mean there is like a real commitment to this as part of the Roman project of imagining a community. Um, and then we would have to ask whether this is somehow a model that is being replicated in other corners of the Mediterranean, but the evidence is not allowing us to sort of pin down decisively um, the extent to which that model is already in play in other co corners of the Mediterranean. Right. So that's a, 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 an attempt at answering your question from several different angles, although I'm mindful that none of these angles in their current form can amount to more than just an oblique vantage um, on uh, the sort of innermost concern of the question. Right. Thank you so much for this great talk. Um, I'm wondering if we need to add a fifth theory, which maybe wasn't in the book of Daniel. Um, I've been thinking a lot of recently about the anthropological concept of schismogenesis. Mm. And Ukraine is a great example of that. You know, we used to be close to Russia, but you know, since the, in the last eight years, um, they've essentially given us a lot of reasons to sort of establish our own identity. And that doesn't really seem to happen in Daniel, but is it maybe a fifth theory to add? Hmm. I like that. We should add it. Why not? I, I, I'm not sure it is in Daniel, but it, it, it would have many, um, many potential sites of application in the Mediterranean, for sure. Um, and I'm going to sit with it and sort of think more about concrete examples that could be brought to test that. Um, some version um, of this is streaking through really the, the first stages of Greek historiography. Um, both in sort of intra-Hellenic context and also um, uh, with, uh, as part of the negotiation between like what it means to Tall Hellenid Zane and what other communities are doing. Um, 
By the Hellenistic period, we see more of an attempt um, at this um, taking shape sometime in, sometimes in fragmentary histories um, that are not super well preserved, but other times um, uh, in uh, historical settings that where the literary record does allow us to speak of, of, uh, of, of a kind of schism of cultural identities that results in like new forms of ethnogenesis. Um, and there is like a, um, there's a sort of Lynn Hunt family romance dimension to this. Um, so what I mean by this is that like the, there is like on the one hand, the, the, the attachment to like a sort of like a, erotics of proximity like you know we we are we are close we are close we're, we're so close but we're also very very different like a, as close as we are i still recognize you as an other and our regional ethnic identity is going to take shape around that right it is interesting to speculate whether in the second and first century bc attaching, you know, directing our gaze at sort of at, at, at some of the Greek sources for sort of Roman Greek contests, we're seeing some version of this, where, you know, Greek sources, for example, are saying, well, you know, they, they have this like weird Romulus and Remus thing, but like otherwise they're like sort of like us, you know, they, 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 they're like attached to Hercules, you know, but they're sort of kind of like us. Um, they have religious rituals that are kind of like ours, right? Um, mm -hmm. There is, though, I, I mean, this is related to um, like a, a, a feature of, of Havasa's text um, that I did not dwell on, but that might also be worth um, uh, raising in this connection. Um, there is the recognition that the other who is proximate to you in some ways might also be actually better than you regarding certain things. This is like another dimension of family romance, right? So, you know, my, my younger brother is actually better at this than I am. Um, so what are examples of this? My favorite example of this, because it's, and it's one that I'd, um, I, I revisit in, in the 2020 book, like any good historian of Roman religion does, is Polybius admitting in uh, Histories Book 6 that the Romans are like the most religious people. And that like, you know, the Greeks, you know, they, they, they can't be trusted with money on oath, but like if you, sw if, if you have the Romans swearing an oath, that's it. Like they, they, they have committed themselves to the gods. You gotta, you can trust them on everything. Now, to some degree, this is sort of fantastical. Like, I mean, one of the other things that Polybius reports is multiple instances of Romans breaking oaths, right? <laughs> but like the, his idea um, is that yes, even though, you know, the Roman, the Romans and Greeks have some of these similarities, and like they're like, kind of close. They're not all that dissimilar. Roman political system is like broadly legible according to Greek modes of like political and institutional arrangements. Nonetheless, they are like actually quite different, and in these certain respects, they're actually better than we are. This is kind of at once sort of captivating and also frightening. Um, and in the first century BC, this gets reworked again by some Greek thinkers. Um, when we get outside of the orbit um, of Greeks and Romans, though, um, turning back um, to the world of, 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 of Daniel and successor texts, here's where one again might um, attempt to sort of pilot um, uh, a reading along the lines that you proposed. Although here it becomes trickier to do because of uh, the effort um, on the part uh, of, of some Jewish texts to decline the strategies of genealogy that are characteristic um, of the forms of braiding together that we see in Greek and Roman contexts. Not entirely. Um, Josephus is like a, a sort of culture broker in this regard, but before him Philo too, but at least partially. So it doesn't carry all that much weight in a sort of non-Greek context to say, well, actually, we like all descend from like the same ancestral heroes who like spilled out from the Trojan War and like then populated all these colonies, right? You have to adopt different strategies, one of which is the strategy of positing one's sort of ancestral or founding community, um, uh, or ancestral or founder figures as more ancient than the, uh, the founder figures of other communities. And so this, of course, becomes like a salient point in the first century C, where you have Philo and Josephus in, in different but in complementary ways saying, well, you know, these, these, these Greek and Roman communities have all these founder figures, but like Moses, Moses is real old. Like Moses is like way older than all 
So like here is a nice chronological exposition of this, and I can show you that if we are using this particular axis upon which to evaluate our different communities and their progression over time, we, we are actually the better community. We, are, we inhabit the same sort of broad geographic space. These founder figures are like broadly analogous. Like Moses is kind of like Lycurgus, but he's, he's, he's older, like I, he came before, right? So this is a, still another way in which this kind of thinking might be teased out from some of the available evidence.